Child and Education Policy Office or at the Thornburg Foundation. New Mexico is, has worked with the, uh, with the Alliance for Philanthropy Engagement Project the last couple of years, and we thought it would be good for folks to hear from a peer-to-peer -peer basis from somebody who is in your position at his foundation, having to answer to his board, having to kind of massage these politics, having to work with other foundations. So I'm just gonna, you know, the way we thought we could do this is to give Michael a chance to kind of lay out what they've been doing in New Mexico that might be analogous for you all. And then I have a couple of specific questions. One of which is, to him personally, you as a foundation professional, why on God's earth did you do this? But let's get to the, the tell us what happened over the course of the last really year or so, but really the last six weeks in particular. I might back up just a little bit farther than that and right. give you a little bit of context. So our foundation is a family foundation. Um, we've, we've been around a while, uh, and by a while, I mean 15 years or so. We're based out of Santa Fe. The benefactors are living. It's a, uh, Eric Thornburg and his wife, Catherine Oppenheimer. Our assets are somewhere around $100 million now. So we're spending about $5 million a year. And Beginning a couple of years ago, what they said was they wanted to, to give in what they consider to be this traditional philanthropic way of supporting causes, but they also wanted to see if they could influence policy in the state of New Mexico. And they picked three focus areas, early childhood education being one, food and agriculture being the second, and um, the third they're calling good government reform, which almost everyone chuckles when they say that's the third one, but that's, that's what we're working on. So there was already, a, a proclivity to um, to do policy work, which I think is that, that was important. However, on that continuum that uh, that you showed, Jason, we were definitely, um, I'd say, squarely in the middle. Um, we did we weren't uh, funding pitchforks uh, and, and anything like that. The other thing that we did was said, um, I, I came on board a couple of years ago, and prior to that, had worked for our state legislature in the Finance Committee. So did have a background in, in understanding a bit about how our state government worked. And I, I think that was part of why I was chosen for the job. Um, but we said, it's important that we work with others in the state, this, this whole idea of um, together we're stronger. So we convened uh, some of the other foundations that fund in early childhood and began um, very, Casually talking about what are you doing, what are you doing, um, and seeing if there are opportunities to coordinate and work together. And one of the interests that emerged was this idea of influencing policy. And, and we were stumbling our way through that when Jason and Jennifer came along and said, we're here to help, and we thought, well, that, that's exciting, we love your help. And at first it was like, uh, well, uh, how much are you gonna charge us for that? <laughs> no, no, we've been funded by the Alliance to do this. And it took us a little while to figure that out. There's <laughs> some trepidation and, and like, do we really wanna release Jason at the Roundhouse? <laughs> and, uh, you know, this uh, Bernadine Sabo? Um, but we, um, and, and so, I'm, I'm getting to your That's okay, no, no, I know you are. But, um, but I would say what we were doing was um, a, a rather clumsy attempt to, um, to to dive into this policy arena. And so we were, as a group, um, How many had, foundations in the group? Oh yeah, I'm sorry, there were, there were roughly eight of us um, who were gathering on a regular basis. Um, seven of us are based in New Mexico. The largest foundation is the Kellogg Foundation, and obviously they're not based in New Mexico, but the, we're one of their place-based funding, funding locations. Um, so between the seven or eight of us, um, one of the things we'd said is it's important that we build the bench of um, early childhood legislative champions, and we had um, organized a series of luncheons for uh, legislators where we were basically, like, like Jason said, they were or actually, as the first presenter said, um, they're educational in nature. We weren't pushing for anything. We were just trying to raise awareness. Um, but that's sort of how we got started. And then what, when Jason and Jennifer came
came along. Oh, the other thing that we did is we recognized that as a group, we were all interested in home visiting. And so we knew that that was a good starting point for us. We, um, we had created this action plan about how um, we could build the infrastructure um, in New Mexico to make sure that when those dollars became available, they were well spent, that there was a good accountability framework, um, those types of things that would appeal to our legislature. So we had all of those things underway, and then when, when we were approached by um, Frontera, basically our decision was, um, now I can tell the story, right? the, the six weeks. Um, well, what do we want to set as a policy agenda? And in our session, um, this was probably October, November, our session started in January, so we knew we, we didn't have a lot of time to, to really be very thoughtful or um, go for something really robust and ambitious, but we said, what if we just pick something pretty simple, like let's increase access to home visiting, and made that our, our policy platform, and we got pretty good you know, heads nodding, and yeah, we could all get behind that. Um, and so then our next step was, well, who would we identify as those unusual messengers? Um, we kicked in some money to the Santa Fe Community Foundation to create a pool fund. And How many foundations did you need? I, I think out of the seven of us, uh, I keep changing the number because it, it varies a little bit, seven or eight, uh, six of us contributed to that fund. And the, it was anywhere from $2,500 up to about $10,000. Most of us put in five grand, um, and, and everyone obviously had a process that they had to go through with their board to get that money there, but um, it happened. I think part of why it happened is I just, I shamed people. I, uh, I called them up and I said, hey, Kellogg said they're in for 10. I mean, come on, can, can you do five? Said, yeah, I guess we will. So we got everyone to kick in some money. We issued an RFP. Um, very quickly, it was a, a very simple description of, you know, we're looking for these unusual messengers to advocate. And again, all of this happened in the last six weeks. Everything right. is described. And, and we just said, let's invite some um, particular organizations to respond. And we brainstormed, who do we think those unusual messengers are? And the, the real question was, who do we think um, are the downstream beneficiaries of a high quality home visiting system. So um, we got the New Mexico Pediatrics Association was one of our grantees. Um, we had a, a legal services organization and then we had this Council for a Strong America who Jason referred to that has um, police chiefs, districts attorneys, uh, military, um, retired military. Um, and then we had an, an interfaith Coalition for Public Education. So pretty diverse group. Um, we, we made those many grants. Um, we called them together right before the session, and we had a training for them, um, which basically was a, here's what you can do, here's what you can't do, here's your one page of bullet points that we'd like you to emphasize in your advocacy work. Well, I mean, you're coming from the doctor perspective for Cop perspective. That's right. Perspective. Yeah, and we also called together our our usual messengers because we didn't want to alienate them. And we said, "You're part of this. We're not trying to take away from what you're already doing, but we're introducing these new voices as well." Um, and then we provided them with some collateral material, so language to use if they wanted to write a letter to the editor. Um, that type. Of we actually did have a great letter to the editor. You have the op-ed that the foundation community produced in the Albuquerque Journal. The Santa Fe New Mexican also ran a letter to the editor on the topic that is jointly written by the head of the pediatric society and the head of legal aid, framing, framed in the manner that we're the, we're the recipients of the state's failure to address these issues early. Please give us less work, essentially. So I was going to tell one, one a uh, quick story, um, we, we had those two building the bench events and then we decided once the session started that we wanted um, to create an, an early childhood caucus. Um, and so we, we had a breakfast, we invited members and had a, a pretty good response. They, it's, it's sort of what you're talking about, they showed up for breakfast and we asked one of the trustees if he would um, introduce 
himself and what we were there to do. And uh, he's one of the signers of the letter. His name is Bill Watt, and he is on the, the board of the Los Alamos National Lab oh, Foundation. Yeah. So I in introduced him as, this is Dr. Watt, and, and he said, well, really, it's Bill. Um, I'm not a doctor uh, in the sense that I can't write a prescription. Now, if you have a question about how to build a bomb, <laughs> I can answer that. <laughs> and uh, it, it didn't get their attention in a different way. Um, and then he says, I'm a scientist, you know, I understand data, and I value early childhood and the importance of investing in brains at that, that age. So, that was pretty powerful and, um, and funny. I mean, you know, so. All right, Michael, okay. I want to ask you a question, because you're in the position that many people in this room are in. You are not a trustee, you're not a family member of the foundation, you're a staff person. Your foundation was generally supportive of this idea, of policy to begin with. I mean, I'm, so I'm not saying you're starting from ground zero, but you're, put, you're putting your neck out a little bit personally, not just from an organizational standpoint, but personal. Michael, not Thornburg, Michael, because one of the things that Jen and I have become convinced as we're doing this is we travel around the country. One of the critical ingredients is to have a Jen Estraline, to have a Michael Weinberg, who really understand how foundations think and understand how the legislature thinks and bringing those two together. But it, it, and why did you do this? I mean, what was it about this kind of work, not just policy, but jointly funding, you know, why, this is, you could have written checks as an individual foundation. Why did you, why was it important for Michael to do it this way? So our big goal is that, at, 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 for the Thornburg Foundation in early childhood is that in five years, we set that as our window, we would have 70% of our kids would be ready for kindergarten. And I think the answer of why is because um, our dollars alone, just funding programs or funding research or wh whatever kind of things we could fund, we, we would never get there. Um, you know, my portfolio is, is a, about a million dollars a year. And um, so it, it, it could just be out of a, from coming from a place of weakness that we're just, we're not gonna do it on our own. Um, but weakness that was, that was weakness that was caused by the fact that you set a very clear vision as to what you wanted. In the, you, set a, you set a stake in the ground in the future, and then that was, then you, had, you were held accountable for that. Right. It's fear based. Yeah. Well, being <laughs> there. It's a very powerful motivator. Um, but it's also, so, so I actually mean that somewhat tongue in cheek about weakness, but it, it's just back to this idea that we're much more likely to, to be effective if if we were working together as a group, there's there's huge downsides to it. Yeah. What are the what are the where did you where do the wheels come off the bus? Well, they didn't come off, but it's I mean it's a pain in the ass to um, to try to develop consensus actually, and to allow everyone um, that airtime that they need to reach agreement. I mean, I have a really strong opinion of what I think needs to happen, and I wish they would just let. Let me do that. <laughs> um, but they, that's not the way. But they're not smart. Works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's this subtle art of making them think that their idea would really is my idea. Um, no, but that, that is obvious. You know that about uh, as a group um, that, okay, we, we all had our, have our own opinions. And so there's a certain amount of, well, what, where's that middle point? What can we live with? And and we found it. And we're actually, um, so our session is over. Jason mentioned um, we feel um, we feel pretty good because our, our revenue situation in New Mexico was it was just terrible this session. I mean it it went down as the session went on. And so we went from um, having a lot of new money to spend to we had to make cuts even to our, our old money. So to come out with uh, an appropriations increase is really something to, that we felt was worth celebrating. We're about to come back together as a group along with our grantees to do a look back and say what worked 
and as well as a, well, what do we want to do for 2017? And to me, this is where things will get really interesting because I think we can be more ambitious this time around and say, we've got this you know, 10 month window that what research do we need to collect? And, um, and really what we know is that it's during the interim that um, the, the real advocacy work happens. So, so the, the folks sorry. before I open it up for these guys for questions, one question, one last question for me. You know, if you were gonna offer one piece of advice to other to other foundations or other state coalition like the one that you've been managing, what piece of advice would you give them? What's the single most salient piece of wisdom that you'd like to impart? So for us, what made all of this seem possible was we kept using the word pilot. And I don't know if you do this, but anytime you call something a pilot, um, you can screw up. <laughs> and that's actually a good thing. And so it took a lot of pressure off of, I mean, we, we had a, um, one of our members, and, and, and this is great, is uh, worries a lot. I guess that's a nice way of putting it. And so, you know, we're in like November and looking at this, <coughs> put together this timeline of here's what we want to do. And she said, oh, I don't, I don't know. That seems really aggressive. What if we can't do it? And I said, well, so what? I mean, what if we can't? You know, the, 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 um, the cost, both, you know, fiscal cost as well as energy is fairly minimal. And we'll have, we'll have learned something even from failing. Um, and so that to me was a real, um, it, it just opened the door to this kind of, let's just, let's just try it and see what happens and we'll wander our way through it. Okay, so we've got some time for questions, a couple of questions, and thank you all for hanging with us. We know this has been a long day. So questions for, for me, for Michael, Jen Asterlin here from Texas, she could chime in with some responses here about the work that she's been doing. Anyone questions about the model, the way that we've been doing this? This is not a shy group. So. <laughs> I, I was wondering, when I, I don't know who all was involved with this coalition of funders that you had in New Mexico, um, but was there an effort made to reach out to corporate grant makers? Not necessarily their foundations, but just... Um, not in this first round. Okay. However, part of our thinking right now is um, how do we grow the table, basically, so that um, we can pull in um, other uh, other grant makers? And I think that that's our mission. That is actually a broader mission of ours, just in general, is to say, uh, if part of our, this early childhood funders group, if we had our act together in terms of what we wanted to do, then others would be more likely to join us, but specifically around the advocacy work. Uh, yes, it is true. Jen, can you, you know, you've done sure. some interesting work on with the different types of foundations that you're, I know you have a community foundation subcommittee now. Yeah, sure. What about corporate philanthropy? Because it hasn't been a big part of your work either, has Yeah, it? we've tried. I mean, they've been reticent, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'll be honest. Um, for obvious reasons, it's not typically a place where most corporate foundations operate in terms of strategy. It's also, I'd say, from a from a corporate giving standpoint, that part of the corporate or the corporation is very separate from the folks who really might have the the power to influence the legislature and they have their own needs. Um, we've engaged the United Ways in a big way. So we have the United Ways of Texas as one of our partners and then we have a couple of regional United Ways who are really active in advocacy in general. And then I'd say where we really use the business community is an advocacy piece. So as Jason mentioned, we do our research and our data collection, but then we put that data into the hands of folks who can actually get the meetings with the legislators, who can testify at the committee hearings, and our chambers, some of whom have been really, really active in the education space, have been some of our best messengers at the Capitol. So that's not bad. Yeah, and we also have a community foundation subcommittee, which is, uh, I think we were talking at our table now, we have seven community foundations from across the state who are really, really interested in, in kind of the whole policy continuum, everything from the research to the lobbying. So that's kind of a new 
that is new. And I think that's going to be an interesting wrinkle for us going forward. <coughs> how you incorporate that different status that they have to engage. And it opens up new opportunities. Other questions? Sir? When you're describing the activities with the session, you said we, but coming from private foundation, did you have to be careful about how you walk the line and what you spend your time on versus what other people are spending their time on? How did you manage that? Um, yes, although I I don't think I came close to the line. Um, the uh, it's funny we we have uh, one of the foundations says if they have to um, even ask the question, are we getting too close to the line? Then they know they're they're too close to the line. Um, the the work during the session was done by the advocates themselves who we funded. So um, we just sort of disappeared into the and we did provide them with research. So one of the things, uh, just an example, um, some members said to us, well, how much home visiting do I already have in my district? Um, how do I know that if I need more? And so we went to our uh, Children, Youth, and Families Department that oversees visiting and were able to generate those numbers and then get them out in the hands of the advocates so that when they wrote letters, they could say, in your district, you know, you're only in 3% or something like that. But that was the, um, it was letting them be the, the voices, with the exception of the letter that our, um, our uh, boards co-signed. And that, um, they're, I think they're allowed to do that. And, it, and even in that, we're not, we're not talking about specific legislation. Um, we weren't even talking about the, the budget bill. Um, in our state, there's a, a um, there's a, a, an executive budget and a, and a legislative budget that are getting hammered out. And we didn't say go with this budget or this budget. We just said grow the program um, more. The specificity to Sam's earlier point, specificity just wasn't there. Michael, you talk about pooling funding and then making grants from that. Can you talk about the pro and con of pooling versus just maybe aligning funding? So I don't know if this happens in Texas, yeah. but they just have done direct grant making to one of those groups instead of running it through. Is there a pro or a con in terms of how the dollars? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think from the grantees' perspective, we simplified their lives a little bit. I mean, I suppose what we could have said is, each of us is just going to pick a grantee type of thing. Um, from a program officer standpoint, uh, it was it was really nice because my our board basically said, yeah, we'll we'll write that check to the Santa Fe Community Foundation for this general concept, but then we didn't need to bring back the grants to them. It was a I mean, we're only six or seven foundations, but then we had a subcommittee of three that made the decisions of who to administer those grants to, somewhat because of the expediency around time. So that, that flexibility was nice once those funds were housed at the community foundation. I would, um, I would really add to that. I think it helps really get focused on what the advocacy message is. So one of the concerns, I think, for all states as we think about this work is the advocates that are already doing this work, we want to make sure that they are well supported, that they have what they need, that we're not pulling funds away from those folks that have been really committed to this for years and years and do it really well. What we're saying to our funders, and this is to Jason's point of meeting folks, meeting foundations where they are, is keep doing all that. Keep funding all the folks that you're funding, your grantees that you love and respect and have great relationships, you should keep doing that. In addition to that, pull this, uh, kind of earmark this specific money to do this very specific advocacy message around a particular issue. So I think it so, helps. So let's just, we're numer just, it's all about the money, we know that. So Jen, uh, the, she, her, her consortium of foundations work on a budget analysis. After they cut 5.4 billion, they came together. The next session, the legislature restored 3.9 billion. So like $4 billion restored of the 5.4 billion. The only objective analysis about what the impact of the previous session's cuts have been was provided by her foundations. Can they take credit for the restoration of $4 billion? No. But how much did you spend on that? About $100,000 less. 
So, okay, let's say that we were 1% responsible for the restoration of $4 billion and $100,000. It will still be the biggest ROI in the history of any grant any of those foundations will ever make before now and the end. And I mean, it is. Michael, how much did you raise this year? Joint uh, our total pool. Total pool. Well, it was thirty. Thirty thousand. <laughs> we didn't spend it all. <laughs> we have some left over. So you think about it. We have a yeah. state the size of Texas that moves the hugest, biggest, most important policy needle for a hundred grand. $30,000 investment over the course of the last two months in New Mexico. Again, not entirely taking credit for the new funding, but our foundations feel like they were part of the call, which means that it will be more than $30,000 next time because the foundation trustees will have tasted the sweet nectar of success. And just to, just to take that back to my point, so that $100,000 that we raised for the research, I lied, it was 150 because we also raised about 50 grand for advocacy work. But that money was used specifically for our grantees to go up to the Capitol and talk about the research findings. It wasn't to talk about early childhood, it wasn't to talk about the high school graduation, it was to talk about the funding cuts. So that's, how, that's another benefit, I think, is that you can really control the money. Uh, last last question. We have time for one more. One, more, one time for one more. If not, are you inspired? <laughs>